Greetings. This is um, Patricia Smith. I'm Senior Policy Advisor for the Reinvestment Fund. TRF is a community development financial institution and one of the three organizations that created the Healthy Food Access Portal. I will serve as the moderator for today's webinar, Healthy Food Access and Healthcare. Joining us today are experts in their respective fields. Bridget Wiedemann is TRF's point person on community health center finance. Under Bridget's leadership, TRF has financed six health centers in five states with projects totaling nearly $90 million and serving 350,000 annual patient visits. Donna Luchin is Director of Sustainable Food Systems for Uplift Solutions, a nonprofit technical assistant advisor. At Uplift, Donna is leading efforts to establish retail health care clinics in grocery stores located in medically underserved communities. Dr. Bedigal is a family physician and the chief medical officer of Complete Care Health Network, a group of federally qualified community health centers serving southern New Jersey. And Sandra Cotterell, Cotman Square Health Center's Chief Executive Officer is building a foundation of preventive and primary health care services for Bostonians that engages community and embraces innovation. Next. Policy Link, the Food Trust, and the Reinvestment Fund have been working together since 2009 on a national campaign to raise awareness about the lack of access to healthy food in low-income urban and rural communities and to promote viable, just, and sustainable solutions. Our work together has resulted in funding for the Federal Healthy Food Financing Initiative um, at U.S. Department of Treasury and Health and Human Services, and in addition, the 2000 Farm Bill authorized a new healthy food financing program at USDA. Next. Today's webinar is part of a series of webinars sponsored by the Healthy Food Access Portal. Our three organizations launched the portal in 2013. The portal houses a vast array of information for those of you working in your communities to ensure the equitable access to healthy food. We selected resources and created content um, for that would appeal to a wide diversity of audiences, everyone from community leaders to government officials and economic development practitioners. If you have not yet explored the portal, I encourage you to do so. And if you have visited the site already, please um, go back and take a look on a regular basis. New information is always being added, and very soon we will be unveiling unveiling a um, new look and functionality for the portal. The PowerPoint presentations from today's webinar, including audio, will be posted on the portal. You can also find recordings of past webinars and notices of upcoming events. The Healthy Food Access Portal and this webinar are made possible by the generous support of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Next. First up is Bridget Wiedemann. She will introduce the topic of why access matters and the potential for collaboration between healthcare providers and healthy food retailers. Please use your chat box to ask questions of our presenters. At the end of all the presentations, I will summarize and direct questions to the appropriate speaker or speaker. Bridget? Hi, thank you, and thank you for joining us for what I hope will be an engaging discussion about creative ways health centers and supermarkets and other food programs can partner to increase access to healthy foods and very likely have a greater impact on people's health than a doctor's office can alone. It is said, food is medicine. My name is Bridget Wiedemann, and I manage the Community Health Center Lending Program at the Reinvestment Fund. TRF is a community development financial institution, a CDFI. We are a mission-based lender. We've been around since 1985, working to build wealth and opportunity for low-wealth people and places. 
With over $1.3 billion invested in communities, TRF has helped make neighborhoods more vibrant and healthy by supporting affordable housing, job creation, quality education, energy efficiency, small businesses, and access to healthy food and health care. TRF works to reduce inequitable access to healthy foods by providing grants and loans to support viable healthy food retail projects, advocating to raise public awareness on food insecurity and accessibility, conducting research on the economic and community impact of supermarket development, and providing technical assistance services to CDFIs, foundations, and other organizations to raise capital and implement programs. Next slide. TRS is fostering connections between supermarkets and food programs and health centers because of the synergies to be found when nutrition and health are jointly promoted and made accessible. We are particularly concerned about low-income communities because, like on so many measures of well-being, they consistently fare worse in access to healthy foods and in population health conditions and disparities. And a lot of a person's health is determined by factors other than their genetics and regular access to quality health care. Forty percent of a person's health and lifespan can be attributed to the social determinants of health, income, level of education, job status, adequacy of housing, and the one we're discussing today, access to healthy food. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. There is something to that. Research is showing how dietary choices, the accessibility of healthy food, and nutrition and cooking know-how are part of a healthy lifestyle and can help people manage health conditions such as diabetes, obesity, and heart disease. Improving food security can avoid and reduce hospital stays. And supermarkets, farmer markets, pantries, community gardens, summer lunch programs, screening for SNAP eligibility, fruit and veggie prescriptions, nutrition counseling, delivery of specialized meals. These are all examples of food as medicine, effective at making healthy food and nutrition accessible with the benefit of improved health outcomes and reduced health care costs. Next slide. This slide of information distributed by the Community Coalition gets right to the point, making clear the inequities and disparities. Looking at adjacent communities in Los Angeles, there is a significant difference in the amount and quality of food options. In South LA, where there are fewer grocery stores and farmers markets, but more fast food and liquor stores, adults were twice as likely to not eat five servings of fruit and vegetables as their neighbors in West Los Angeles. And, when it, and then it doesn't come as a surprise that the Southern Los Angeles community also has two to three times the rate of obesity and three and a half times more diabetes-related deaths. Healthy eating and health are determined by where you live. Next slide. I want to introduce the concept of Federally Qualified Health Centers, or FQHCs, and their important role in the health sector. We invited FQHCs to participate, Codman Square from Boston and Complete Care from South Jersey, because FQHCs have a unique community-based role in the health system. They are primary and preventative care providers of comprehensive medical, dental, and behavioral health services, as well as other supportive services for high-need places and populations designated as medically underserved. FQHCs are a medical home for promoting health, preventing illness, and treating chronic conditions. FQHC is a federal status under HHS that is competitively sought and rigorously maintained that comes with certain benefits and advantages as well as requirements, and I'm going to highlight just two. First, FQHCs must serve everyone with fees adjusted based on one's ability to pay so their patient populations tend to include more uninsured and Medicaid patients than a private medical practice. Next slide. Second, they are governed by community-based boards in which over 50% of the board members are users of the FQHC's health services. And I think this is the point that makes FQHC's compelling partners 
They are of and for their communities. Their health centers are hubs not just of health services, but of a range of activities striving to improve the well-being of their community by addressing the many social determinants of health, education, empowerment, housing, recreation, and nutrition. So these FQHCs, and I should say there are about 1,200 FQHCs with over 9,000 health center sites across the country, they are committed on many levels and, and in broader ways than you might think to the same neighborhoods and people where many of you work. And that is why we are excited to make these introductions and connections, bringing the food and health sectors together so they can combine forces for broader goals and impact. It is also a timely conversation as we are in the midst of, you may have heard, health care reform under the Affordable Care Act. A key component of that reform is a greater focus on and increased access to primary care to improve health and lower costs. And that is the space where FQHCs operate. Soon you'll hear from our FQHCs on the panel about what they are doing to enable their patients to access healthy food, doing things you may not expect from your doctor's office, and what impact they expect it to have on people's health. But first, Donna Luchin of Uplift Solutions will talk about how her supermarket have been rethinking and incorporating health clinics. Next. Thank you, Bridget. My name is Donna Loyan. I'm the Director of Sustainable Food Systems for Uplift Solutions, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've been doing to connect healthy, uh, healthy food access with health care. Next slide. Uplift Solutions is a national nonprofit technical assistance or consulting provider helping to bring food access solutions to underserved areas throughout the country. We were founded by Jeff Brown, an owner of 11 Philadelphia ShopRite supermarkets and a leader in the Pennsylvania Fresh Food Financing Initiative. Jeff's vision was to, to found an organization with retail experience to be a resource for both the grocery industry and for the community development and public health care organizations that are serving underserved markets. Uplift has provided development services to grocers, government, nonprofits, and CDFIs throughout the country. Our mission is to deliver entrepreneurial solutions that support underserved communities for the joy of a healthy life. Next slide. One of the things that we do is we rethink what it means to be a full-service grocery store. We see grocery stores as a unique opportunity to serve a greater purpose in underserved markets. Once we're able to locate a grocery store in a previously underserved market, we're able to really think about what are the services that the community needs. Beyond access to healthy food, oftentimes the communities often need access to other services such as equitable financial services, uh, a connection to the sustainable ur urban agriculture that's popping up in so many cities today, strengthening alternative energy, thinking through different types of uh, LED lighting or um, composting programs that can really uh, decrease the impact of the grocery store in the community, but also uh, decrease the operating costs in making this, the grocery store more viable working on anti-obesity market-based research. Are there methods and strategies that we can do in grocery stores using the same tools that operators use all of the time to promote sales, to promote the sales of healthier items? Working with reentry and workforce development programs. Thinking through home delivery for underserved markets. And today I'm here to talk to you a little bit more about where we see the role of health clinics and health programming in this greater vision of a full-service grocery store. Next slide. So QCare is a brand from Uplift Solutions we developed, and it's a brand of health clinic facilities operated by a federally qualified healthcare center, or FQHC, and co-located with a grocery store in underserved communities. Why we think this is so impactful is because it leverages a couple different strengths. First, it leverages the strength of FQH theories to serve these underserved markets. And I think Bridget did a great job of highlighting how unique these community health centers are in, able, in their ability to serve the community with both uh, preventive and holistic care. Additionally, this model leverages a grocery store's foot traffic. 
hours, location, and often in-store pharmacy. So these grocery stores um, that are oftentimes visited by everyone in the surrounding community can become a hub and can drive people to a new community-based location for healthcare services. And finally, this model strengthens the tie between healthcare and healthy food. However, if you look at it from a grocery point of view, the, this model also benefits the store for a couple of different reasons. First of all, it brings rental income. Another benefit to the store is increased pharmacy and over-the-counter medication sales. And finally, this increased customer count to drive total store sales. So this really can be a win-win-win um, for the community health center to have a community-based location, for the grocery store to have these, in, these benefits, and for the community to be able to go to one location and have many of their needs met. Next slide. A little bit more about the QCARE model. So this is operated by a family nurse practitioner and is often able to see and is, is able to see both children and adults. The model is uh, located within a grocery store between 500 and 900 square feet. So oftentimes they have uh, one, two, or sometimes even three uh, exam rooms within them. Accepts most insurances, has a sliding scale fee, which is custom for FQHGs and is really accessible to the local community. Uplift's role in this is facilitating this partnership. So Cheryl is going to talk about her clinics. And in that case, that partnership was created without a facilitator. But oftentimes, we see FQHCs in one circle and grocery stores in another. And our job is really um, to facilitate that partnership. Second of all, we license the space from the store and sublicense that space to the FQHC. The structure is developed because oftentimes there's a capital need from the FQHC to uh, finance the fit out and the capital that is needed to start the clinic. So we do this and we that in the sublicense agreement we bundle the QCARE brand and the financing for that capital fit out. And finally we provide ongoing relationship management and support with programming and marketing. Next slide. So a little bit beyond just the healthcare clinic, we always want to make sure that we're being holistic. So if you think of our kind of holistic hub of uh, full service supermarket, this is even trying to look at a holistic model of the healthcare services. And our job in this is to also provide nutrition benefit, nutrition education, benefits, application assistance. Um, and the way we do that is we often leverage SNAP education partnerships to offer free nutrition counseling, cooking demonstrations, and group wellness classes. So this is really helping to build a stronger connection between the healthcare services within the clinic and the larger grocery store that it is sitting inside. Additionally, we've found that uh, partnering with health insurance companies can be a great asset because many times they have content and materials already developed for education on wellness, nutrition, health, and they have them catered to you know uh, children's programs and senior centers. And you'll see that I actually included um, a topic schedule from a nutrition from a program that was for seniors, um, and this was already developed with the health insurance company and they were looking for a community-based location, and oftentimes grocery stores can be that. And finally, we add also application assistance for public benefits. So Uplift looks for partnerships with existing nonprofits that are already doing this work and bringing them in so that you know, when we're thinking about the social determinants of health, we are thinking not only about health care and food access, but also access to benefits such as SNAP, formerly food stamps, energy assistance, uh, CHIP, um, and other programs that the community is entitled to. Next slide. So I just wanted to finish up with giving a case study of one of the QCARE clinics. And this was actually the first QCARE clinic that opened. It's in partnership with Family Practice and Counseling Network, an FQHC located in Philadelphia. Uh, this clinic opened in August of 2013. And it received, in the past year, it's received its MA number from the state, which is a big accomplishment, accepts all insurance, and has a sliding scale fee starting at $20. 
It's currently receiving grant support to conduct mental health screenings within the grocery store, has conducted outreach to promote health care coverage options under the Affordable Care Act, and within less than a year is averaging over 10 patients a day, which um, 11 is their break-even point. Uh, so this clinic is financially doing very well in its first year. And we're excited to, to say that two more QCare clinics will be opening this year, one in Newark, New Jersey, and one in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and we're really excited because not only does this brand build the QCare brand, but it also helps us identify the best practices to further support this model of combining healthy food and healthcare together. Last slide. I just want to thank you for taking some time and listening to us this afternoon. I am going to pass it over to Cheryl, who's going to talk a little bit about her model. Um, and my contact information is on this slide for anyone who's interested. Great. So um, this is Cheryl Dedical, and I want to thank you all also for being here today um, and the other speakers as well. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that Complete, Complete Care is doing in southern New Jersey. Um, and if you could go to the next slide. Uh, this is a map of the state of New Jersey. And if you look down at the bottom of the map, you'll see this area around Bridgeton and Millville that many people, including many lifelong New Jersey residents, actually don't know exist. So about an hour south of Camden, but not near the shore, is Cumberland County. And that's the county where most of our clinics are concentrated. Um, it's an area that has some smaller cities, you know, population around 60,000 at the most, and then a lot of farmland. And this is where a lot of the fruits and vegetables that folks eat in New Jersey and in the surrounding states actually comes from. Next slide. So Cumberland County also is the county in New Jersey that year after year after year has the worst health care outcomes. Um, we have the highest rate of premature death, uh, premature morbidity, disability, and pretty much every social, economic, and health-related factor that impacts health is worse in Cumberland County, um, you know, including poverty, child poverty, all those sorts of things that impact health, and also including lack of access to healthy food, which is ironic given that this is an area that actually grows much of the healthy food for the state. So complete care, next slide. Um, is a federally qualified health center or community health center um, and also a migrant farm worker health center that serves about 55,000 patients. And as I mentioned, most of our sites are in Cumberland County, although we have a few in neighboring counties. We provide integrated primary care, uh, women's health, some specialty care, dental care, and behavioral health services to New Jersey residents. And we do that on a sliding scale. Uh, we take, again, Medicaid, Medicare, most insurances. And we use an electronic medical record, as do most FQHCs, that really allows us to look at our data, look at healthcare outcomes, and try to continuously improve the work that we're doing. Next slide. So just to give you a flavor of what uh, our working environment is like and the lives of our patients, I've just included a couple of photos. This first one is a couple of our nurses out at one of the migrant farm worker camps where many of the farm workers live uh, and work. And um, they're out there doing health screenings. They also go out and do uh, health education. And they do a fair amount of work just making sure that farm workers know how to get health care when they need it, and particularly focusing on the in-store clinics that I'm going to be talking about because of their easy access to care, which is so important to the farm workers who mostly have to work when they can work um, or they lose income. This next picture is uh, one of our outreach workers, the woman on the left, with a couple of the folks working on one of the local tomato farms. Next slide. So our Right Cares, which is our name for our in-grocery store clinics, are located in local ShopRite grocery stores. Um, we currently have three of them. We just opened our third uh, earlier this year. And they're, they're in the grocery stores. It was a model that was built around access and outreach. So they're open every, every night. Uh, and they're open Saturdays and Sundays. The idea being that uh, for people who don't get sick time or paid sick time, may even lose their jobs if they, if they take a day off to go to the doctor, we really need access for them um, after hours, because otherwise they're really never going to be able to come in. Uh, you don't need an appointment. You can just walk in. And the model is really to try to make the service readily available. So people with very limited time who can get there can come in and get seen. Um, follows the same sliding scale as all our other sites. We take all the same insurances. And we use our same electronic medical record, which is really important so that we don't have communication gaps. Um, 
you know, one of the major issues we have with many of our patients is we'll be chasing them around because they had an abnormal study or because they haven't followed up for their hypertension or their diabetes. This way, if they come in for a sore throat, we've got that information right there. And we use these to help prevent people from having to go to an ER because they have an ear infection or so th sore throat, something that doesn't really require an ER, but for which they really don't feel like they can wait for care. Next slide. So these are modeled after retail clinics or convenience clinics, as, as some of the other speakers have discussed. Um, similar to the Minute Clinic or the Walgreens model clinic, except for all these links to primary and preventive care, but similar in the sense that they are quick and easy care where and when people need it. And really that idea of bringing the care to where the patient is rather than expecting the patient necessarily to be able to come to us. And I think that's a really key piece of this is that ability of people who are doing something else, who have busy, maybe even chaotic lives, to get the care they need. Next slide. So the National Association of Community Health Centers put out a paper actually on convenience or retail clinics, um, which can sometimes be perceived as a threat to FQHCs because often with a low-income population, um, especially folks who are working poor, they often will only come in when they're sick. And if we don't capture them to talk about prevention, to talk about blood pressure, to talk about diabetes when they come in with a sore throat, we may never get a chance to do that. And so the, the risk of fragmented care of people only going in for that one element and not getting that, that kind of connection to a primary and preventive model of care um, is a concern. So these are the four possible responses that uh, were suggested to this model. And the, the fourth option, which is start your own. Um, it's very uncommon, as it turns out, but I think it's a really important one because I really think that this is both a true service to patients and to the community and a real opportunity for community health centers to avoid the fragmentation of care that urgy care centers and convenience uh, care centers can sometimes put, uh, put us at risk for, for having and really help us to reach out to the community. Next slide. So a right care model is kind of a hybrid of this. It's like the retail clinic model in terms of the patient's experience. They can get in quickly. Um, they can get the care they need for their acute illness, but it connects them with, with their past history. The provider taking care of them has full access to their medical history, can actually schedule them for follow-up. And part of our model of care is at each visit to be looking for those opportunities for prevention and for, for us to help people control chronic conditions. And then we also do things like uh, sports physicals at the right cares because so many of the kids really need to be able to play sports. It helps them stay in school. It helps them stay engaged. And for a lot of working parents, it can be really difficult to get into a doctor's office to get that done. So um, we try, to, again, to tie those patients back to ongoing primary care, but we will do sports physicals at the right cares. So how does this tie in with food? So these, these uh, right cares are located in the grocery store. And initially, we were really just thinking about the access and the outreach model. But through the work that the reinvestment fund and this group has been doing, we started talking about this food connection, which seems so obvious because of location. So our biggest, most successful right care is located um, in a, a big new shop right owned by the Bettino family in Vineland that was funded uh, through the reinvestment fund and through other investors. And it was funded including a space for an FQHC and also including a large community room, which really offers some important opportunities. It was put in, in an area that was previously a food desert and that also borders two areas which, which had limited access to supermarkets. Next slide. So as I was looking at this, uh, this phenomenon of the right cares, which have gotten more and more and more popular, um, I started wondering, so what, what are we really achieving? Are we achieving what we wanted to achieve? Is this really serving our patients? Is it serving as an outreach tool? And looking at some data. And um, for the most part, yes. Um, for the most part, about 80% of the patients we're seeing there are either our own primary care patients coming in for a sick visit or they're brand new to us, but they then go on to follow up and, and get engaged in primary care at one of our, um, our larger sites. But there is a subgroup of people who did seem to be becoming repeat right care users without connecting to primary care. And when I look more closely at those patients, they, many of them have hypertension, diabetes, and so on that are really uncontrolled. So they don't seem to be at least successfully engaged in primary care anyway. So that sparked a, um, a set of conversations internally, and we decided to survey our patients to find out what was going on with that group and uh, kind of with the larger 
group of folks who are using the right care um, in terms of their needs and also their, their wishes for this site. And we found out that, um, as we had suspected, there is a group, about a quarter of patients, who tell us that they really have trouble making appointments. These are often people, they may have jobs, may have young children, they may be caregivers for sick relatives. Often people, again, can't really take time off for work for appointments. So the, the ability to get care on a walk-in basis is very important to that group. But interestingly, three quarters of patients told us they'd really like to be able to use these sites for wellness, prevention-focused visits, and also for chronic disease care. So we're talking a great deal about what we can do to meet that need in the community, to see if that can help us. I'm sorry, next slide, I'm jumping on ahead. Um, to, uh, and one more slide, I apologize. Um, to try to maximize the utility of this clinic and its location in the grocery store to really start impacting some of those health numbers I showed you earlier. And what we've done is actually to form a collaboration with the grocery store, which itself runs community programs, with the local Y, which runs fitness programs for the community and has uh, a real interest in figuring out ways to engage more people in those programs, and through our own diabetes education nutrition programs. Um, we've formed a collaboration to co-locate those programs and to build on them at the Vineland uh, ShopRite grocery store, utilizing their community room, um, placing a community health worker in the store, and actually creating some kiosks to help us do diabetic education, um, diabetes prevention education as well. Um, that community health worker then could actually be available to help people who may not be health literate or terribly health literate to link up with these various services, um, can even walk through the store with people who are interested in how to choose and cook with healthy food to talk with them about their food choices. And the other piece of this that will be critically important for us is the evaluation component so that we can look at what we do and see what's working and what isn't, um, expand what works well, and really try to build on this. Um, because I think, you know, at the bottom line, we really don't want to see Cumberland County at the bottom of those health rankings year after year, and we really feel like this is a chance to make a difference. So um, thank you, and I, I will turn things over to, uh, to Sandra now. I'm sorry, not to thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Cheryl, um, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Sandra Cotterell, the Chief Executive Officer at the Cobb Square Health Center. And I'd like to share with you just some of the work that we're doing at the Health Center to provide and promote access to healthy food in our community. Next slide. So the Cobb Square Health Center's um, mission is to serve as a resource for improving the physical, mental, and social well-being of the community. And as um, Bridget spoke to earlier, our mission is very broad in that we view um, the health of the individual just as important as we view the health of the community and we make every effort to be responsive to some of the social concerns that um, have been discussed earlier like housing, employment, education, and including access to food. We're located in the heart of Dorchester in an economically and ethically diverse community. A large, um, many of our um, patients and families are low income. We were founded in 1979 and we are a level three patient-centered medical home. We have about 21,000 patients that make up uh, 110,000 clinical visits and as you just heard from Cheryl, we also offer a full service of um, range of services and programs. So we have primary care, we offer urgent care, laboratory, radiology, mammography, dental services, and behavioral health services. So we're broad in terms of um, our scope. I want to talk a little bit about our space and our campus. Um, we have a high school and our main clinical building. We have two teaching kitchens and soon we'll have a third teaching kitchen. We have two large community spaces which have capacity for about 150. And then we have a health work fitness center um, also on our campus. And I mention this because this allows us to serve as a resource for some of the programs that um, I'll share with you um, later. Next slide. 
So most recently, we did a community needs assessment, and um, we actually did focus groups and interviews with our patients, members of the community, um, neighborhood development groups. And one of the things that we found out was that people were concerned about um, access to healthy food in the community and even referred to us as a food desert. And like so many other speakers, um, we also have within our community a high portion of obese adults as well as higher rates of um, diabetes. Next slide. I'd just like to review with you, um, again, some of the unique programs that we've offered. Uh, we've offered what we call a veggie prescription program. And as part of that program, it would allow our health care providers to prescribe fruits and vegetables to our patients as part of their care plan. And um, the patients could then take that prescription and use the vouchers at our summer and winter farmer's market. So that was a way to make sure that our patients made the connection between their health as well as the importance of having access to healthy foods and making the connection that this is, as Bridget um, said earlier, it's, a, it's an important part of your diet. It's like a prescription. It's like medication. And so um, through our VeggieRx program, we write the prescriptions, and they could be used at the local um, winter and summer farmer's market. Next slide. We've also um, done healthy weight groups with our children ages 3 to 17, which includes weekly and biweekly meetings where they are learn about healthy eating and cooking and shopping and that's guided by one of our nutritionists who works with one of our family um, medicine physicians and during that the participants set goals about diet and exercise and after they prepare their meals they actually then sit down and continue to have conversations of, again about the importance of healthy eating and in this slide you can see um, this is one of our teaching kitchens where there's a small group gathered and they're actually preparing um, a meal. Next slide. We've also done something similar with um, seniors in the neighborhood where we um, hold a monthly class for senior community members and it's an opportunity for them to come together in a civic way so that it gets them out of the house and into the community and promote social interaction. And again, they come together, they learn about simple and affordable meals, they learn about healthy recipes, they prepare meals, they eat lunch together and then they're able to then use our Health Work Fitness Center um, to participate in Zumba class. Next slide. So we've had, um, we have two seasonal farmers markets at the Cobb and Square Health Center. One is a summer's farmers market which has gone, which typically runs from June to October. And in 2012, we um, were the host of the first winter farmers market and our what we call Great Hall community space. And one of the th and the winter's farmers market runs from January to March, and it was an attempt to bridge the gap between October um, and when the when the summer's farmers market ended and the winter farmers market began. And this year, we've actually, as we were closing down the winter's farmers market in March, we heard a lot of participants said, you know, why can't you go longer? So as we're preparing now for the winter's farmers market, we're looking at is there a way to expand beyond March so that um, people have greater access to healthy foods? And in this picture, you can actually see the um, Winters Farmers Market in session and the amount of people that it draws from the community. And not only do we provide access to healthy food, but there's also opportunities for um, food demonstrations and different activities as part of the Winters Farmers Market. Next slide. This is one of our um, larger teaching kitchens right now. And so this is a teaching kitchen that's in our newer part of our um, clinic, which is um, also co-located near the school. And here and this, you see a um, demonstration by one of our local vendors, Crossroads Community Cafe, 
that's a local business that's built around providing healthy food and teaching youth job skills and she's using one of the teaching kitchens for that. So the kitchen is used for uh, to prepare healthy meals for our students. Soon we hope to encourage our staff to use it as a way to um, improve their health and wellness, but also it's available to the community. So um, the community can rent the space for demonstrations, cooking classes, and um, other kinds of venues. Next slide. We've also um, partnered with uh, Fair Foods and Fresh Truck, which is a mobile healthy food market, which offers fresh and affordable um, fruits and vegetables. This truck is located in our parking facility across from our Health Work Fitness Center. And so um, for members who are leaving the fitness center or coming, they're able to, for $2 a bag, get access to fruits and vegetables. And during um, when the healthy, um, when the Fair Foods Fresh Truck is available, a lot of the Health Works community uh, training staff really work with the members to stress the importance of not only um, exercise but the importance of a healthy diet is part of balancing. Next slide. So, um, in terms of what's next for us, we are. Um, Looking forward to having Daily Table, which is a pilot store that will be opening by Doug Rao, a former president of Trader Joe. And he'll be um, actually opening a store at our location where Health Works Fitness is. So we're looking at that as being both exercise and healthy food end of our campus. And one of the things that Doug Rao would like to do is make sure that there's affordable nutrition in the community, both prepared food as well as fresh produce that will compete with the fast food market and so that it will compete with the McDonald's and the KFC in the community and that people will use this as a, um, a more healthier option as opposed to the fast food markets that we see in our neighborhood. We also are looking to replicate the Veggie RX program as part of a new program called the Healthy RX program, which would um, allow our providers and clinicians to write prescriptions to daily table for um, patients and clients that we serve. And recently, the health center received funding through the Kendall Foundation, and we are looking at making sure that there's um, that we're targeting our staff to promote healthy eating habits and encouraging them to use the on-site dining area where there's healthy foods because we feel like it's important that um, as a resource to the community that we're able to role model um, healthy and good behavior. And that's it for me. So I'll turn it back over to Pat. Okay, thank you. Um, like that was a lot of information, and we have gotten some great questions that came over um, the chat box. And I'm going to um, get the conversation going uh, and really um, asking Donna if you can talk a little bit about um, whether or not QCare um, is a clinic that is limited or just restricted to one particular grocery chain. And another question coming in from the West Coast, is there, um, does QCare work on the West Coast? Or, and if not, if you were interested to like fostering a partnership with a federal health, federally qualified healthcare center in California, what would you suggest that person do? Hi, Pat. Thanks for those questions. Um, I, QCare is not limited to one uh, type of grocery store operation. Um, uh, Uplift works with all different operators from large chains to uh, small independents, and so all of our programs do the same. So we are open to establishing uh, clinics in many different types of stores. We've even talked about going beyond, um, while the model kind of sits inside of a grocery store, we've even got, thought about doing it um, co-located either adjacent or upstairs or something to that effect um, to healthy food and still developing that programmatic connection 
for when there's a case where a retailer is really interested um, but is smaller or doesn't have the footprint space. In terms of the West Coast, uh, we are a national organization. We have not yet kind of, uh, made or established any Q care clinics on the West Coast, um, but we would be more than happy to uh, talk to that FQHC to see if it would be a good fit, to see if we, you know, we do have grocery uh, connections nationally, so potentially we could help them bridge a gap um, or bridge a connection with an operator um, or really just try to see if we can make that connection to uh, help them establish a clinic. Okay. And I'm actually going to take the a question that came in uh, regarding whether or not these initiatives um, prioritize local fresh food sustainably grown food. Um, of course, the farmer's market, I think, speaks for itself. The example that Sandra gave, um, TRF um, sort of is the um, fund manager for the New Jersey Food Access Initiative. And one of the things that we look at when we're underwriting not only the financial viability of a store, but whether or not that store sources locally, because that's another economic um, driver in communities, particularly our rural communities. And um, I know for a fact that the store in southern Jersey, which is partnering with um, Complete Care, is very committed because you know to purchasing locally, particularly in the Vineland area, which is really a farming community. So they have specialized signage about um, sourcing locally. Um, the next question, I'm actually I'm going to send the way of Sandra. And Sandra, it, it's a little bit of a hybrid of a question. Um, there's someone who is experimenting with a initiative they call Health Bucks, which is kind of interesting. Is is basically they are um, um, connected with, um, they want to connect um, members of the new ACA Exchange Health Insurance Plans with um, health and wellness programs. Um, and one way they're doing that is giving what they call health bucks to incent um, these exchange members to buy produce at farmers markets. And so their question is, well, how do you promote that? How do you get individuals to see the value of buying fresh produce as opposed to, you know, maybe canned um, fruits and vegetables? So I mean, I think that um, a lot of that is through education. So it's constant education, whether it's through our own enrollment staff, whether it's our nutritionist. Oftentimes, I think the messaging um, from even the provider, I think, is an important. And that's why one of the things, that's why I think the Veggie Rx program has been so successful in a lot of the work that we do because you know, it's it's pretty powerful for a patient or a client to sit in an exam room and hear from a physician that this is an important, here's a prescription for it, and making that connection. So a lot of it is through our education, and we also are doing a lot of outreach and enrollment with our team. So I think it's that consistent messaging from every point of person that you contact with. And I think sometimes it's just the visibility of knowing that, well, wait a second, the health center's out here writing prescriptions for healthy foods, the doctor's encouraging it, the nutritionist, and they're also promoting the importance of us getting access to care. So I think it's a, con it's a concerted effort for continued education with, with the patients to make that connection. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And actually, the next question is one of those um, big policy questions, and I'm going to actually ask, um, any of our speakers to comment on it. And, and basically what they're asking is what federal or state and local policies um, are, could help better support or incent health care centers and uh, food access initiatives. Um, you know, are there any um, barriers to, to partnering? Um, are there that you think um, you know, can stand in the way, and is there a role for government, whether at the local level or the national level, to help facilitate um, some better partnerships or stronger partnerships? And maybe start in um, 
you know, Cheryl, I know you've been thinking a lot about some of the policy issues, and you haven't um, spoken yet, so do you want to get us going with that? Sure, sure. I mean, you know, the first thing that comes to mind for this, uh, the, the best tool that the government has for making things like this happen um, are the new access points, or NAP grants, which come out periodically. And, you know, there's been, since the ACA was passed, there's been quite a number of them. But if they were to target a grant at encouraging this kind of collaboration, and, you know, I think if they did that, clearly there needs to be room for different ways of doing this. Because I think what Codman Square is doing is very different from what we're doing, but, but both have real value to the community. So, you know, that kind of a opportunity. The thing that stops a lot of FQHCs from doing this, as far as I understand it, is, is the cost of building the thing. You know, it's that initial capital investment to get it up and running. They're self-sustaining once they're running. I mean, you know, we, they're billable visits just like any, uh, any visits that we do, and then we also get our federal grant uh, for the work that we do. So once the thing is built and running, they can be sustained. But I think if the, if the federal government wanted to, to invest energy in this, I think that would be a great place to start is helping with those capital costs. Mm -hmm. um, and Donna or Sandra, do you want to add anything to what um, Cheryl just said? The only thing that I will add, this is Donna, is that sometimes there are um, local or state um, policies that make this a little bit more difficult. And I know in the case of the, the clinic in North Philadelphia, um, the way that the law was established uh, for the clinic to receive an MA number, which pr allows them to see Medicaid patients and be reimbursed for that, um, was not allowing this type of partnership initially um, because it was in a retail setting. Um, so I think that you know there are definitely there is definitely a role for government, um, it, but it might look a little bit different uh, based on each location. Mm -hmm. Um, and sort of like on this the is, other end. Oh, I'm sorry, Sandra. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the only thing I would want to add to what um, Donna and Cheryl said is um, I think that reimbursement and funding is a challenge, but I also think that as we look at some of the more global payment models that are happening as part of a lot of work around um, just payment reform, that may also be an opportunity to um, help support some of these initiatives because a lot of the programming that we're doing now, we are in some ways dependent upon either grants or capital as mentioned. And so to the extent that payment reform can be open and flexible and allowing us to use the resources to meet the needs of our patients regardless of what kind of service it is, I think that may also um, help us in the future. Okay. And, and I was about to turn to Bridget um, in part to ask the other sort of like policy-focused question that came across, and that is evaluation and metrics. I know a lot of these collaborations are fairly new and just, you know, getting underway, but um, already we need to think about how do you measure, demonstrate impact, and if it's making a difference. And do you have any comments on, on that? Yeah, I think... Um and this kind of speaks to some of the goals, uh, the, the government goals, with the Affordable Care Act and the experimentation and flexibility, as Sandra mentioned, kind of payment reform might allow new kinds of ways of providing care that are outside of the typical doctor's visit. And so trying to figure out which of those services are effective and efficient in improving health outcomes is really what people are Seeking. And so having the right measures and, um, and kind of studies done to demonstrate the effectiveness of a program is important. Um, Cheryl mentioned how uh, TRS is partnering with Complete Care on um, a program at their right care of, with uh, diabetes effectiveness treatment um, and setting up the measures to see if there's a population that goes through the program and what the benefits to them are compared to um, the standard services will be something that helps us assess the impact of this program and allow it to be a model um, to be expanded 
with other um, settings and health centers. So I think those kind of efforts are going on and many health centers trying to figure out what's the, um, you know, what, what's a, an effective way of, of delivering care and um, just kind of doing a general research scan is, is showing that regularly we're getting new findings, um, even like the, the slide that I showed that's linking the food opportunities in a community to the health outcomes. As we see more of those things, I think that will start to um, change policy and, and maybe change the way health centers are reimbursed for the services they provide. And in the meantime, um, I think as Sandra uh, mentioned, a lot of these um, initiatives are pretty much grant dependent. In fact, there was one quick question, Sandra, just, you know, how is the veggie prescription program funded? How is that supported? It is, it's funded through a grant. All, um, all of our, um, and in fact, the Healthy RX program, which we're also looking to start, is also um, funded through a grant. So all of the programs are currently grant funded. Um, one of the other um, questions, and, and Donna, this, uh, you know, you talked about fostering these partnerships and nurturing them. Can you maybe talk a little bit, and we heard um, you know, Sandra talk a little bit about um, and, and Cheryl, the capital cost of fitting out a clinic and building that. Can you talk a little bit more, one, when an operator's interest, the supermarket is looking for a partner um, to, to partner with a health care clinic, how do you assess whether or not when how can, it's a good marriage and, and how do you ha negotiate kind of like uh, what may be the capital needs of that health care clinic and the needs of the grocer as he's trying to put together the financing for a fairly large and complex building. I imagine um, you know, negotiating things like rent and the other things can get complicated. It does, and I think that um, a lot of times our value comes in understanding both the retail side but also understanding you know, why the clinic is so important to the community. And I think that one of the things we try to do is we realize that those capital costs um, can be, although you know the grocery stores are often very large projects, that capital cost can be um, a little bit added burden on what is a very tight uh, margin business um, and very expensive startup for the grocery store as well. So we try to take that off the operator um, and in return really ask that the operator consider a a, a, a reduced rent in the first couple years to allow the clinic to be able to break even. And then what we do is we try to find the capital cost for that fit out and the um, sometimes even some of the equipment for that FQHC from an outside source, whether it be from Uplift or whether it be from a lender, a CDFI that is already um, in the business of financing uh, community health centers. Um, so that piece we try to take out of the negotiation. It makes it um, a little bit easier. But then also understanding, you know, that that is the greatest barrier for the FQHC. So understanding, you know, what the rent payment might be needed um, in order to kind of uh, support the FQHC through the startup and the initial phase of building its volume and in return um, realizing that the grocery store is giving up some square footage in that space. So you're right. Um, Pat, that each time it's a little bit different. Sometimes it can get a little tricky. Um, but I think that as long as um, everybody is kind of focused on this end goal of having this co-location um, and kind of a win-win, um, we can usually get there. Yeah. And actually, I think that's a, a great note to, to end on and to sort of like wrap up our conversation. Um, we do, we at the Reinvestment Fund and through the Healthy Food Access Portal really find this an exciting time and this emerging part partnerships and collaborations that are being formed, uh, we think address this issue of access and health outcomes through education um, and, and accessibility. Um, I often say um, that improving health outcomes uh, for many um, in, in low-income communities who may suffer from chronic disease, 
that one, you have to make the healthier choice an easier choice, but as important, engaging that individual uh, and supporting them in helping them to understand what's best for them from a diet perspective is as critical. And this concept of food as medicine, I think, is a great organizing tool. Um, if you can advance, thank you. Um, so these are some um, information. A number of people ask, what is the website, www, healthy food access. Uh, if you have questions or if you felt we didn't get to your question, we had a lot, please um, feel free to, to shoot it to us again via info at healthyfoodaccess.org. Um, as I said, this webinar and the slides will be posted on the portal. It takes us about a week to get them up um, um, for you, so don't look immediately after the webinar. And I just want to again thank you for taking time out of your busy day. And if you haven't visited the portal, please do. And if you've already done so, go back. Like I said, we're going to be unveiling a new look um, very shortly with some great new functions. Take care.